Hi, welcome to our interview show in which we interview LGBTQ guests who are important contributors to our community. We want to acknowledge that All Things LGBTQ is produced at Orca Media in Montpelier, Vermont, which is unceded indigenous land. Enjoy the show. Hi, I'd like to introduce Martha Shelley to All Things LGBTQ. Hi, Martha, how are you doing? Okay, how are you? I'm pretty well, thank you. How's life in Portland? Quiet, in spite of all of the news stories that say that the town is bur being burned down by Antifa people. That's a bunch <laughs> of BS. Uh, <laughs> You're doing fine there, huh? <laughs> yeah, it's all quiet here. Yeah. Um, most of the rioting has stopped, though, hasn't it? Or most of the demonstrations have stopped? There's continuing sort of low-grade marches, but no violence. Uh, occasionally, you get some provocateurs who do something, you know, downtown, but the rest of the city just goes about its business. <laughs> That's the way it seems. Uh, you know, the news always wants to make it bigger than it actually is much of the time. So I'm going to read a little blurb um, about you so our audience has some idea, you know, if they don't know, which I can't imagine they don't know who you are. So um, about Martha Shelley. Martha. Martha Shelley is one of the authors and owners of Abishu Publications. She's a longtime political activist from Brooklyn. After the Stonewall riot, she organized a protest march that morphed into today's gay pride parades and was one of the founders of the Gay Liberation Front. Her essays, poetry, and short stories have appeared in many anthologies. She has published three books of poetry, Crossing the DMZ, Lovers and Mothers, and Haggadah, as well as two novels, The Throne in the Heat of the Sea and The Stars in Their Forces. She now lives in Portland, Oregon, and is passionate about social justice, dancing, and mango moose cake. So you have a third book that came out recently, which is part of a trilogy, correct? Right. So the trilogy um, is in, now includes a meteor shower. These, this is a thr trilogy about Jezebel, who was queen of Israel uh, during the ninth century BC, and who gets um, whose name has become synonymous in uh, popular culture with an immoral woman. In fact, she was very loyal to her husband and her religion that she brought with her from her country. And that's what the uh, Jews and Christians couldn't stand. It was a complete conflicting religion. Um, so she was not immoral. In fact, if she had uh, cheated on her husband, she would have been killed. Yeah, my grandmother used to call me a trolloping Jezebel once in a while, so it has that connotation, right? So, okay, there's three novels, and then there's um, four books of poetry now. The new one is released from the wheel, which I'll re read from later. Yes. So I wanted to talk about your childhood a little. I, I know that you grew up in Brooklyn, and... Um, so what were your early influences in, in your family? Were your parents writers or? Um, no. My no. mother hardly had any education. She was taken out of school at an early age and put to work. Um, the, her family came from Poland uh, after World War II, no, sorry, after World War I. Um, they moved to Havana because they couldn't get into the United States and um, they were desperately poor. Um, the, those members of their family that did not leave Poland were killed in the Holocaust. So, uh, my mother, when she was living in Havana, used to go to these dances. She loved to dance. So uh, there was the Jewish Community Center and the Communist Youth Center, and she went to both dances. Um, she told me later on, oh, I'm not a communist, but <laughs> and then she would tell me these uh, ideas that are essentially come from the left. Um, she said, I only know what every mother knows, that every child should have enough to eat. And the second one was um, never cross a picket line, which is definitely a socialist 
communist, etc. Thing. Mm -hmm. She was afraid to, to, for me getting involved politically because she wanted to protect me. And she'd seen, you know, people, this young man that she really liked who went to Russia to help support the revolution and was killed for being Jewish in one of Stalin's purges. Uh -huh. My father uh, had been quite a radical during the depression when he was out of work all the time. You know, uh, odd jobs here and there. But then um, he took a job in a defense plant during the Second World War and it was the first steady work he'd had in years. Um, from that, he got a government job. So he didn't teach me anything politically, but it was just knowing where he was coming from, kind of by osmosis, that I became, uh, I guess you'd call it radicalized. They, <laughs> Did they meet in the United States or in Cuba? They met in the United States. My mother came here as an illegal immigrant. She came, got on a boat from Havana, came to Florida, got to New York, worked in a garment factory sewing. Wow. And met my father at some kind of a party and <laughs> they got married. And she liked to dance, so it might have been a dance party. <laughs> I have no idea. My father was, you know, had two left feet, so yeah. <laughs> he would dance with everybody else, but uh, he was her husband. <laughs> so in your long career of writing, did you have any early influences or even during your writing as an adult? Who were, you, who were your influences? How, how did they work in your, in your life and your writing? I just read voraciously um, everything I could get my hands on. So I can't say who my influences were really uh, as a writer, uh, you know, everything from um, Beowulf to uh, Chaucer to Shakespeare to, um, you know, all of the women writers of the 19th century, uh, Jane Austen and so on, I just read. And when did you know you wanted to be a writer? when I was a kid. I also wanted to be um, a, an astronomer, uh, a pilot of a spacecraft, and um, a visual artist like Van Gogh. Uh -huh. that, that one to my sister, she said she was afraid for me. She thought I would end up going crazy and cutting my ear off. <laughs> <laughs> um, do you have a writing routine now? Oh, that... I forgot one. Yes. Um, uh, biologist. Oh, a biologist. Okay. Yes, that was very important too. And you settled on the writing and kind of. It was, um, it required the least. Okay. I tried when I was in high school to get into the space program. I went, the air force came around to our high school. It was the Bronx high school of science. So they were interested in getting some bright kids and, um, they were recruiting. So I went to them and I said, you'll teach me how to fly, won't you? And they said, no, we don't teach girls how to fly. I said, what do you teach girls how to do? And they said, be secretaries or weather girls. I walked away. I didn't need them to teach me that. Um, so I was uh, too early in life for the space program. Right. Uh, as far as the other um, options, they required more investment financially. I mean, I didn't have the money to take flying lessons. Right. So be a pilot anyway. Um, painting and stuff like that, you need more than, um, more money. And I was pretty poor than being a writer. Yeah. And um, with a writer, all I needed was a typewriter at that point. Yeah, or a pen and paper even, huh? Right, exactly. Yeah. So you are retired now or you're retiring shortly? I will be retired in one week. Uh-huh. So do you expect that your writing schedule will change? Uh, oh, yeah. you... All of them all of the time that I now spend working for money, I'll put into writing the next book. Okay. And um were you teaching out in no, what were you doing in what are you doing in Portland? Well <laughs> work. Over, let me explain something. Over the years I've done many things, including teaching at uh, college uh -huh. level. Um, I gave that up because it was taking too much time and creative energy. Yeah. Um, and I didn't have any anything left over for writing. What I've been doing most recently, really actually for the last almost quarter century, is research 
uh, in medical legal cases. For instance, if you get um, in an accident, you're paralyzed, some drunk driver hit you, you've got brain damage, whatever. Um, my job was to find out the costs to take care of you. Nursing, with new wheelchairs, huh. surgeries that you're gonna need, appointments with doctors, someone to clean your house because you can't do that from a wheelchair, mow the lawn if you've got one and so on. Uh, and I would present whatever research I did to the woman I worked for, who is a, an expert witness in these cases. She would go to court or have or be deposed and um, they need to settle the case or go to trial. And I'd be juggling different cases all the time. Some well, of that's, them, hmm? That sounds really interesting. I don't think I've ever heard of anybody who had that job, you know? That's well, some of it was really interesting. Some of it was repetitious after a while. Sometimes I got to research new equipment, like if you're paralyzed, I would find out the cost of some device that would help you move your arm or do the work for you, um, or some cu um, cutting edge surgeries that had been developed. Um, mm -hmm. and sometimes I'd call overseas to find out what they were doing over there, and then eventually the FDA would approve them over here. Interesting. You probably helped a lot of people too doing that. I um, hope so. so I was reading your blog and I thought, hmm, this could be a memoir. Are you thinking of turning your blog into a memoir at some point? Yes, um, parts of it. Um, occasionally I'll do I'll write an article that's, you know, about what's going on um in current politics and stuff, which is not going to be in the memoir, but a lot of it is um stuff that happened when I was a kid or happened during gay liberation front times, things like that. Right so, now, go ahead. You go Sorry. Ahead. No, okay. I'm just going to go ahead. All right. One, one thing I'm planning on uh, writing now is I finally bring my teeth and saying, okay, I'm going to stick my foot in it and write about the current situation with Israel and the Palestinians because I spent some time over there. And I'm just going to write about what I saw not um you know reporting on what everybody else is saying and doing but what i personally saw i hope you have a place to hide <laughs> <laughs> um that's very touchy um and uh when you're writing poetry or you're writing prose do you get in like a different headspace do you do different things like sometimes I read other poets or I, you know, walk around the room singing. Uh, how do you get into the spirit of writing? Do you have a special, anything special you do to do that? Um, okay, if I'm writing prose, what I'll do is I'll think about the things that I need to say and then I'll write an outline and um, keep the outline sort of on one side and then um, start writing things in kind of an order of what what happened or how I want to say it. And that goes for fiction as well as nonfiction. Um, if I'm writing poetry, there's no outline involved. It's just something bubbles up in me and I start thinking and the words start coming into my head. And then I write a first draft and then I continue with the next draft and so on until I've got what I feel is a polished poem. Uh, and when do you think now that you're retired, you're going to start working on your memoirs, your memoir? About a week after uh, retirement, because the first thing I'm going to do is clean up my office. Uh, yeah. <laughs> I mean, it really does look like a tornado hit it. Well, that might help your like headspace, right? To be able to settle yeah. down something. Okay, and I think for the last, um, I think our audience would love to hear a poem from you from your new collection. And we will put across the screen where you can purchase um, Martha's writing. So please read us a poem. Okay. Um, all right, this one, I just opened the book and uh, come into this page. This is called The Woman in Artichoke green. A late August afternoon, 
The sun wallows in the breakers like an old dog rolling in something that smells real good. Happy as the sea lions on the beach barking. Here on holiday, we stand on the sidewalk, watch the slick beasts and pretend this day is forever until a brick red SUV pulls up and parks. A woman in artichoke green steps out, a floppy hat, a summer dress and matching slingbacks, offset by lipstick the color of the car and of course a coach bag, I almost forgot. Gold drips from lobes and fingers that shimmer with rage. She points at the pinnipeds, they ignore her. I pay plenty to rent here, but those things are spoiling my summer. They're noisy, they stink, and they're lazy. Somebody ought to shoot them. Someone who once shot humans overseas tells her off. She turns on her little heels, leaves, and leaves me wondering, what would it take to make her wish to coexist? Elocution lessons to modulate those joyous honks? Deodorant under the flippers? Jobs at a marine show? Or even better, carrying trays in the cafe near her hotel, frilly little aprons round those thick necks, hustling for tips. And perhaps, I imagine, the woman in green will try the sea lion's trade, will strip, drop hat and sandals on a strand, and dive into the chill Pacific and learn to catch fish with her teeth. <laughs> that's great. I love that. So that's a great note to leave on. Thank you so, so much. Um, I, I love your work. Um, I read it online and anywhere else. And um, I hope other people will just dive in there and get your work. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. You have a great day. Hi, everybody. I'm here with Alana Dykewoman lesbian pioneer, activist, and writer. I'm delighted to have you here. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you for inviting me. It's our great pleasure. I've been following your work for many years. Uh, but let's start with a little bio, if I may. Um, and I'd like to deliver it in the second person. Um, you were born in New York City to middle-class Jewish parents and you and your family moved to Puerto Rico when you were eight, correct? That's right. You studied fine art at Reed College in Portland. You got a BFA in creative writing from California Institute of the Arts. Right. And later you got an MFA from San Francisco State where you taught for many years. Yes. Um, you live in Oakland and your publications are many. Uh, you wrote River Finger Woman, a novel under Alana Nachman, published by Daughters, Inc. in 1974. You wrote it when you were 24? I actually started it when I was 21. I, and that, you know, that went through a bunch of phases, but the bulk of it was written when I was 21. Very impressive. <laughs> uh, short stories and poetry. They Will Know Me By My Teeth was published in 1976 by Majira Press. Yeah. Fragments from Lesbos, Poetry, Diaspora Distribution in 1981. So you have a steady output here. Nothing Will Be As Sweet As The Taste, Selected Poems, by published by Only Woman Press in 1995. That's a very interesting press. It's British, right? Yeah, it's in London, based in London, yeah was based in London. The, the woman who, who, um, who was the publisher and the, the force behind that, Lillian Moen, died uh, about two years ago. So it's, it's gone into history. I'm sorry, I didn't realize that. I had some contact with that, some slight contact. Remember they published those gossip publications? Yeah, yeah, it was a wonderful press. Yeah, yeah, that's a shame. Um, Beyond the Pale, 1997, Press, Press Gang Publishers. That's an award-winning, fabulous novel. I, you know, it's so moving and profound. Um, Thank you. And Moon Creek Road, Spencer's Inc. 
2003, I had the pleasure of just finishing that yesterday. It's a great collection of stories. I really enjoyed it tremendously. And finally, Risk, uh, published in 2009 by Bywater Books. I also finished that yesterday. And that is your Oakland novel, Critic. Uh -huh. Yeah. Um, what else you've been doing? Oh, I had a collection of poems that came out in 2015. Um, what can I ask? From it's a it's a sapphic classic that came out um, from uh, Julie Enzer's publishing of Sinister Wisdom and the Midsummer Night's uh, Dream Press. Um, uh, yeah, they have a whole collection of what they call sapphic classics and uh, Pat Parker, uh, Cheryl Clark, uh, Minnie Bruce Pratt. Uh, Tatiana de la Tierra and me, and uh, I don't know who else. I don't remember who else is in the series. Well, speaking of Julie Enzer, another activity you've engaged in recently is you have co-edited with Judith Katz to be a Jewish dyke in the 21st century, this uh, issue of Sinister Wisdom. Yeah. And if I may, I don't want to jump ahead, but I love people's biographies. And <laughs> your biography in this uh, speaks to one of your current projects. You're currently working on a full length play about your spouse, Susan Levenkind. 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 Life, mm -hmm. Love, dementia, and death, incorporating issues around the right to die while in residency with Alter Theater in San Rafael. You're grateful to all the lesbian connections that have led to your useful old age. That's my aspiration to have a useful old age. Looks like you're doing just fine. <laughs> well, I'm working on it. Um, how did you, let's go back to a little biography. How did you end up in Oakland? You've lived there many years. I have, I've lived here since 1983. Um, when I was going to read, I spent some time on the coast of of Oregon, and I thought Oregon was the most beautiful coastline that I had ever seen. And I still think that after having seen coastlines in Europe uh, and uh, Scandinavia, doesn't match the fjords of, of Norway, but, but it is a beautiful coastline. So I determined I was going to live on the coast of Oregon. And in, uh, I don't remember the year 19... 80, 1970, 1978 or nine, I moved from Northampton where I had been living um, to the coast of Oregon, which is a whole long complicated story about how we got there. But I lived there for four years and um, we started commuting from the coast of Oregon down to the Bay Area because that's where things were happening. There was a Jewish lesbian writers group there was a fat woman's swimming group. There were all kinds of things happening. And women from the Bay Area would come up and stay with us in Oregon, you know, like for vacations and stuff. So um, at some point, I felt like um, it was just too racist to live there on the coast of Oregon. It was the only place in the United States where, besides traveling through the South, but you know, that was briefly, but I felt much more in danger as a Jew than as a lesbian. And um, there were active groups of the Klan nearby and of the very various militias. And it seemed a very dangerous place for people of color and Jews and native people to live. Mm -hmm. And for a while, we had a lovely group of, of lesbians who lived there. Um, Native women and Black women and Jews and a few white women. And um, uh, we all just felt it was too difficult to, to feel safe there. And so we left. Mm -hmm. So naturally, I came to Oakland. And I've just stayed here ever since. Mm -hmm. There is no other place to go from here. <laughs> well, in those years, I moved from Indiana, where I came out, to, uh, to Boston. And so I was in Boston during that flowering of lesbian print culture between mm -hmm. 78 and 84. 
where all those um, vibrant women were coming to read and Persephone Press and all that excitement was happening on the East Coast too. Right. Then I moved uh, back to the Midwest in 84. So let's talk about your writing. Have you always wanted to be a writer? It's not a question of wanting. I always was a writer. Um, I, I mean, my mother um, told me that when I was in first grade, I wrote a poem about, you see that blue Chinese um, sculpture that's behind me that my parents got as wedding presents. They were very popular back in the in the 40s when my parents got married. But anyway, I wrote a poem about it when I was in first grade. And the teacher called her in and said, why did you write this poem for your daughter? And she said, what poem? <laughs> she had never seen it. So she brought me the, the, the sculpture of the lion to, to have at some point um, because of that. So it just, it wasn't a, really a choice. It was the only really avenue I could, I could follow. Was it related to activism? It certainly was in later life. Well, it became related to activism. I mean, I was always a lesbian. I knew I was a lesbian as soon as I heard the word. And before I heard the word, I just thought I was peculiar for um, loving women instead of being attracted to men in any way. And this is when I was between the ages of three and eight. I just, I already knew. And that was that. So, um, a lot of my writing in college and uh, uh, was coded until I until I wrote River Finger Women. Um, and my impulse in writing River Finger Women was to write a lesbian novel with a happy ending, which um, there were none at that time. I mean, there was The Price of Salt, if you could call that a, a happy ending. It was kind of a, the woman loses her child in order to have this lesbian life that we never see. But, um, and I wrote it before Ruby Fruit Jungle came out or any of those other books that Daughters published and some of the other people published right then. Um, and I tried to sell it in New York and there was a, when I was graduating from uh, California Institute of the Arts, somebody had a connection with uh, Maurice Gerodius, who had published Henry Miller, and they were starting a, uh, uh, a series of feminist pornography for mm -hmm. women. So I sent it to him, and they decided that it wasn't really a novel, and they rejected it after about a year. And then right about that time, Daughters opened, and one of my lovers said, you should send it to, to Daughters. So I did, and they wrote me back and said, Come see us. We want we want to publish your book. Well, I have a personal anecdote about that. I think I mentioned I came out in 1975 in Indiana. My mm -hmm. partner at the time got hold of that book, and we were discovering lesbian feminism. I mean, you know, I I met lesbian feminism in Boston, but we were immersed in lesbian feminism. And she came home and she said, "You got to read this book. It's wonderful." <laughs> so. It was a big I, hit. I, 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 I'm glad to hear that. I think of it as a children's book in a certain kind of way. You know, not a children's book, but a, a book for late adolescents and people in their 20s. It's all full of sex, drugs, and a little tiny bit of rock and roll. Mm -hmm. A lot of road tripping and, and stuff. So, so yeah, that's how I, how I think about it. But I had a lot of fun writing it. And ever after, I wished I could write a novel that quickly. I mean, it it went through a, a number of revisions and it did take a number of years. It was published three years after I started it, but um, that was pretty quick. Later books have taken me much longer time to write. Um, your, um, I just, your next book, you did 10 years of research for the next novel? Yeah, right. I did a good 10 years of research. I have to confess, I spent 10 years writing my dissertation. <laughs> um, it wasn't half as compelling <laughs> as Beyond the Pale, which was a fabulous, wonderful, groundbreaking 
volume, in my view. Um, let me ask you about influences, though, before we proceed through your writing career. Who were your early influences? Well, I was always writing poetry, and and first I was influenced by all those male poets of the uh, middle twentieth century who were very famous. Um, but and then I was influenced, fortunately, by Muriel Ruckheiser, um, who I just uh, revere as a writer. I have to say, and in writing Beyond the Pale, I was really in influenced by Audre Lord Zami. Mm -hmm. um, and the the thing that struck me about it was how she took her time to let the story unfold. And I felt like at the time, I felt everybody was writing in this kind of postmodern uh, and very rapid fire way of uh, of writing. And I was and realism uh, was not appreciated. Um, and I appreciated Zami for its realism, and it's a it's a uh, mythobiography, as she calls it, and and Beyond the Pale is not, but nothing like that. But um, but the the way that she let her her story and the life that she was living it and how she imagined the life she was living it unfold was a was a tremendous influence. Um, on my ability to say, well, I'm going to write this book, and I'm going to let it unfold in its own in its own form. And then, you know, uh, when I was doing the research, I was reading uh, Emma Goldman's early newspapers, uh, Mother Earth, mm -hmm. and I was really impressed by how much poetry was incorporated in in that, and how they saw. Uh, poetry is part of the movement for for social justice, as it was not called then, but uh, socialism, anarcho-socialism, syndicalism. Um, and I incorporated that in Beyond the Pale because I wanted also to be true to that time period when people's, when poetry was part of the way that people related to um, in the early um, 20th century, in the in the progressive era, when um, which which is what I was uh, writing about in the second half of Beyond the Pale, um, poetry was a way that um, people talked to each other. Not they didn't talk in verse, they but they would read poems at meetings and they would include poetry in all their publications, and that was a way of stirring the people's feelings. I mean, they didn't have recorded music the way we have, not to mention they didn't have the internet and they were just beginning to have telephones. So, you know, they spent their their evenings when they had any free time, which was very minimal, going to to meetings and debating things, but they also read poetry at those meetings and they included it in all of their publications. That's so interesting because don't you think that anticipates the second wave where poetry was central in our political movement in a way that I don't think it has been since. Um, the poet, remember Jan Clausen wrote that wonderful essay, Movement of Poets. Uh -huh. and Adrian Rich and Lord, they all galvanized us. That's right. I, I think that that's true again. I mean, I think the Black Lives Matter movement is full of poets. And there's slam poets and there's hip hop poets and it's very, um, it may not, not seem familiar to us who are older, but, um, but I do think that poetry is on the rise again as a medium for uh, expressing concerns around social justice. I've seen a lot of it on the internet, a lot of different people um, embracing different causes in poetry. That's very encouraging. I love yeah. poetry, and it's such an enhancement to our lives and also our activism. It's a right. it's been for me. Um, so I mentioned the community of writers in the second wave. You probably had writing groups, and when you were writing, is that true, or a group of friends who supported you? Um, 
I always had a community and I felt part of that community. In Northampton, well, actually, um, Judith Katz and I, we tried to form a, a writer's collective and I was working um, distributing women's films, which are different than, than writing, but um, we did have a, a women's film co-op and we were distributing films around the country. Um, but I didn't have like a, a formal writing group at that time. Um, but I, I had a community of people. We opened a, a building, we called it The Egg, and there was a lesbian garage and a film co-op and a lesbian jeweler and, uh, and a printing press. Um, all of those things we had, you know, in a place in, in and we had a place called Lesbian Gardens um, and on the third floor of the Women's Center where we would have coffee shops and invite people uh, to come up on Friday nights or Saturday nights and do readings coming from New York and Boston. And so it was a very fertile time and there was a lot of activism and, uh, and political fighting. Which How would you compare that? Go ahead. It, it, in, some, in a lot of ways, it mirrored what I later saw in the progressive era. I mean, we we fought in about, you know, in the progressive era, women fought about whether the the women they were organizing into labor unions should join the male labor unions, that they should be whether they should be pushing for that or whether they should have a female labor movement that that was uh, uh, totally woman based. And they had all of those kinds of arguments that really mirrored the kinds of arguments that we had um, in the 70s. And how would you compare that to our current community of writers moment? It, it's hard to compare it. I mean, as populations have grown and as the internet has grown, it, it creates a platform for a lot of voices and there are so many more voices that it's hard to really focus on any particular one. You have to really choose which social justice causes you're going to be paying attention to because there's no way that you can pay attention to every cause around the world anymore because they're all in front of you. I mean, my email every morning is like 40 emails asking for money or support or to sign a petition. And, you know, I have to choose where I'm going to put my attention. And I'm sure every activist feels that way, that they have to choose how to best put their, their uh, energy um, into, into various causes. Um, and so each particular part of the movement has it's infighting. It's, you know, you're not pure enough moment or you're not, you know, why are you forcing me to be so pure, you know, reaction. So I, I think that's going on and it, and it continues to go on. I mean, it happened um, in the economic revolutions of the, of the late 18th, of the late 19th century. Um, in Russia and around the world, and it's ha and it happens today on on a much more kind of grandiose scale. There's every single I I see that I have friends who are uh, friends on Facebook and and real life friends who are deeply involved in the Black Lives Matter movement, and there's a lot of infighting that goes on there, and there's a lot of infighting that goes on, uh, and that I mean not just infighting, there's a lot of really productive, amazing work coming out of all of these movements. Um, there's a lot of difficulty among Jewish women talking about, about um, Zionism and, and the Palestinian occupation and how best to support the Palestinians and, and what, our, what our understanding of that is as, as Jews. So it's... Uh, it's it's uh, very common everywhere. <laughs> mm -hmm. Well, believe it or not, we're getting to the end of our 
conversation. I was wondering, you have a couple of poems you are willing to share with us. Would you mind doing that? Yeah. Um, and before we, before you introduce them, I want to thank you for coming and invite you to come back again anytime. You are always welcome. Okay. So um, lately I have been um, living with death in a much more intimate way. And by living with death, I don't mean that I am uh, fearful or personally um, depressed in any particular way. I'm not. I just, I just have, I see that death is, um, is around me and I have conversations with it in different forms. Um, my partner had a Lewy body dementia and died of a seizure disorder that seemed to be uh, part of that whole syndrome for her. Um, a good friend of mine recently died of cancer. Several good friends of mine recently died of cancer. So it's, it's something that I have to be in conversation with. So this first one is called um, Death is a School. It's actually called a full course load. A full course load. Death is the school and all the teachers in it. Isn't that enough to say? I am too tired to copy the class lists, the syllabi, the sections in different locations on death's vast campus. Though I've been at it more than 50 years, used to fall asleep in my 8 a.m. class of Attic Greek, a language no one alive exactly speaks. Dead Tongues, room 205. See what I mean? No one knows what the course reading will be or where until death summons you to her office, says, now look again at your grandmother's burns, your mother's oxygen, your lover's seizures. What did you learn? What did I learn? Death hurts, but like a hamster in a dog's mouth, you pass out. That's just the basic course, death scoffs. A student pokes her head in. Genocide 610? Past, present, and future, death remembers all her offerings. End of the quad, fourth floor, colonial building. You will recognize the door. She returns to me, our oral examination. Okay. Here's what I understood first. What you give thinking, damn, I'm generous, gee, I'm good. Aren't my gifts just fine? You find turned inside out, humbled for a lifetime because off the cuff, close to glib, you gave your grandmother roses, your mother a slice of tongue, your lover that one last trip. Humbled, death says, that's good enough. I'll pass you on to level seven. How many levels? Three dozen or 90, 111 in this cluster. You've seen death grin, haven't you? Her face is in the papers, the camps. Rising ethers form her skeleton above streets of corpses and in cartoons. You reach for her bony fingers and find instead a schedule for next semester. Wonderful. Do I have time for a very short one? Sure. Okay. This is in What Can I Ask, comes from What Can I Ask, the 2015 anthology. If you were my home, I would be your garden. If I was your garden, I would want you to cultivate me, to plant, water, weed, harvest, and like I promised, I would feed you. You can always eat what straggles up or what's gone to seed, but nothing will be as sweet as the taste of the woman you tended purposefully. 
Alana Dyke woman. Thank you for joining us. Thank you. My deep pleasure. So following along with checking in with those first time LGBTQ plus legislators, we have invited back to all things LGBTQ representative Emma Mulvaney Stanek of Chittenton 62. Welcome, Emma. Thank you for having me. I'm excited to be here. Oh, and, and we were so excited by your election. Looking at you know those 15 out candidates who were running, you were the one who seemed to have the greatest wealth of political knowledge, a, you know, a strong background. You know, you had done labor organizing, you were part of the Burlington City Council. Mm -hmm. But still, were there things when you actually became a legislator that were unexpected for you? Oh, yes. <laughs> I don't think anyone could honestly answer that any other way. Um, I think the other unknown factor um, that no one could prepare you for was legislating by Zoom for four months. I mean, you, you know, in some ways it leveled it leveled the playing field a little bit because everyone was operating for the first time for an entire session by Zoom, meaning returning legislators and new legislators. But, um, you know, I really thought walking in that I would understand a bit more of the politics, the small p politics of how to interface with people, build relationships and all of that. But the thing I was completely unprepared for was the fact that it is very hard to do that via Zoom. We, don't, we can't stop in the halls. We can't you know, chit chat after a committee meeting is done. So it was very hard and it, it felt very um, um, isolating, I think is the best word to use it because really the only time you had and the only information you were going off of, at least in committee and certainly on the house floor was what these little you know, two by two squares were looking like. And everyone's two dimensional there. You're trying to read body language. It's very easy to misread things and overread things, accurately read things sometimes. So. Um, that was that was kind of it felt like a graduate course level out of the gate of just how do you interface here and um and you know i think uh, there were certainly some things that i was better prepared for I, I stepped right up to be the assistant caucus leader for the progressives um because i thought hey i have i have a little bit more knowledge than everyone else with a very new caucus most of the folks are newly elected legislators and i wanted to support selena colburn who was our caucus leader so i also got a front row seat into some leadership house meetings and whatnot and that that definitely felt more intimidating than I anticipated because you know there's such a um, there's such a deference to hierarchy and tradition and some and, and some of it I get and some of it I think is really um, counter to really an open democracy at times and really allowing um, sort of frankly some modernization of of how we operate with each other and a, a healthy questioning of rules and operations so. Overall, it was it was great. It was definitely some major learning lessons along the way, though, as it comes to culture and tradition within the building combined with Zoom. Thank, thank you very much, because you just reaffirmed all of the things that those of us who have been state house groupies were also thinking about the session and accessibility and really being able to read what was going on. You were on the house or you are on the House Commerce mm -hmm. and Economic Development Committee. What are some of the bill, you had 39 bills referred mm -hmm. to your committee, both from the House and the Senate, seven of which were voted out. Mm -hmm. What were some of the significant pieces of legislation that the committee voted out that people should be aware of? Right. Well, I wanted to start by saying of those 39 bills, there are some bills that we never even touched. And I want to say that because there's some really um, powerful bills on that wall, well, virtual wall, whatever it was this session. Uh, if for folks watching at home, I haven't been to the state house. Apparently, there is a literal wall where there's some old school index cards or something that go up. And um, but we were in virtual land. So it's kind of more of a virtual concept, really. Uh, people can find that on our website if they're curious. But, uh, you know, and I mentioned that because there was a big push this session to get down to just COVID related stuff, get it out quickly. We don't have a lot of time, we'll, we'll bring it up next session. And that rhetoric was used time and time again. So we had some really interesting um, concepts up on the wall and it kind of, some of them were potentially going back from house general to us around BIPOC um, economic development ideas, uh, BIPOC land ownership stuff. Um, 
And, uh, and again, some of these were going back and forth between House General, but also a whole lot of unemployment related bills that would have got a lot more into the lack of functionality, but making it a functional department and some good um, and important pieces. And those were never pulled off the wall to be discussed. So while we did move a small number of bills, there were some, some bills that really I felt were just as timely that we didn't, we didn't bring off the wall. But what we did move, I'll just mention um, two slash three, because two of them got merged together. Um, the first one is what is really our omnibus economic development bill. So H159, uh, it was, it started with a better places program, but it, it then became, I think there's like 15 different programs in it. The Senate has also made some amendments. It's not quite back from the Senate, but this bill had a range of things like um, additional funding for uh, for folks who are trying to go back to school um, and, you know, access um, more scholarships within a state college. Uh, these are adults trying to get back into the workforce. Remember, there, that's actually another part of our committee title, which we often drop is workforce development, which I'll come back to and happy to come back and talk about a little bit more because I don't think we barely scratched the surface in a coordinated way around workforce development. We did a whole lot on business recovery, economic recovery for businesses in this committee this session, but the workforce piece was was lightly touched to um, to put it, um, put it politely, I guess. I think we could do a whole lot more to coordinate that and really help Vermonters upskill and um, get the resources they need to either finish a degree or get apprenticeship program, you know, program um, exposure, et cetera. But 159 has a whole range of stuff. There's some tourism pieces in there for uh, more marketing of Vermont to get tourists back to the state once we start to really reopen from the pandemic. Um, there is, you know, there's some pieces in there. Uh, the Better Places program I mentioned is a community development program, which uh, there were some pilot programs towards the end of 2020. Folks might remember in certain communities where parklets and other things were sort of popping up to attract people back to the downtown to really um, help blighted properties and other areas of town just sort of get a sprucing up. Um, there's a whole community matching funding mechanism with that, which again, helps the community have a little bit more buy-in into that, into those projects. But the piece in 159, and people want to geek out on economic development, they can read the whole bill, but the one piece about 159, I had, um, a bit more to do with uh, from the onset was a, a specific BIPOC business development section. Um, the section's been renumbered now, but it's section, I think it's 14 at this point in the version that's uh, that's coming back to the Senate. And the short version of that is that after all the economic um, relief grants to businesses in 2020, and folks might have read this a little bit in the paper, there was some money earmarked for BIPOC owned businesses and women owned businesses about um, uh, one million each, I believe. Don't quote me on that. It's been my my memory's a little fuzzy after four months of legislating. This is all last year, but you know the the short version is the state didn't know who the BIPOC owned businesses were in the state, and there's no data collected. They had very little information on where to go on, and on top of that, clearly, if you don't know who they are, you don't have much of a relationship, obviously. So getting the word out about a, a kind of an emergency related program like business relief dollars during a pandemic is kind of hard to do. When you don't even know who, who to reach out to. Um, so they ended up contracting out with Vermont Partnership for Fairness and Diversity, which is a Brattleboro-based longtime organization, um, to help do that work last year. And after they were done pushing the grants out, because, you know, no, shock, no shocker, all the money got used. It just took a while to find people, about three weeks, versus women-owned businesses, which are mostly white women-owned businesses in Vermont, which went, they got snagged in like three week, three days, I think, or something, the statistics said, with those two pots of money. So at the end, the partnership did a great survey and they really asked those businesses, what um, what what could the state do better to shorthand it basically? And the and the BIPOC businesses said, we're not gonna join the chambers of commerce. They're very, um, they're very white to shorthand it again. They're non-inclusive spaces. They aren't responsive to our needs. They barely understand what, what it's like to be a BIPOC owned business. Why would we join them? But there's a longing for some sort of comparable organization, not necessarily needing to be a BIPOC Chamber of Commerce, but one for which does that technical assistance and support and can partner with the state. Um, and there's a whole other you know, slew of, of possibilities. So in 159, we earmarked $150,000 for BIPOC folks to come together and really start to um, uh, put together sort of analysis and a set of recommendations for us in January so we can start making better policy and also start, there's a data collection piece of that as well, voluntary, because we don't want to force people. But the Secretary of State will finally ask that if people have registered businesses in the state before, you know there's like a business um, registry program. So that will be a piece of it. So we can finally make like more targeted policy decisions and see how BIPOC businesses are really doing versus 
we just don't know who they are. So we can't do anything response. So could you- Oh, and I have one more bill. Sorry, I can, let me pause well, on that and see if you have questions. Yeah. Well, I was gonna say, could you talk a little bit about S10, which yeah. is the bill for which your name came up about a critical debate about coverage relative to unemployment benefits. And hopefully this was the second bill you plan to talk about. Exactly. Yes. I was just realizing I'm going way down, way down this, you know, because 159 was like sort of the first half of the session. S10 became the second half of the session, major bill, I would say major debated bill in House Commerce. So S10 is the only unemployment bill that was sort of moving through the session uh, that that had an opportunity to do something for workers, unemployed workers, as well as businesses. So the short version is when it came out of the Senate, um, the Unemployment Trust Fund, which funds unemployment claims, is funded by an employer tax, um, and it's all regulated by the federal government. And the short version is if people, um, if we did nothing, the, the system based on current law tries to write itself and refill the UI trust fund based on how much gets used. And obviously everybody knows 2020 was a huge outlier where you know, thousands, tens of thousands of Vermonters were on unemployment and it, and it drew down the unemployment fund quite a bit. I really want people to know though that the unemployment fund for Vermont in January, February of 2020 was one of the, if not the healthiest, meaning most funded, most robust, doing the best um, out of all the states in the country. So we were, we were fine going into the pandemic and even that big drawdown, it's not like the UI trust fund's about to bankrupt by any means. Um, but the system tries to write itself. So J July is when the new tax rates go out. And if we did nothing because it was drawn down so fast in one year, it would be a huge tax rate increase for employers. So um, the, the governor really strongly wanted to fix it or put a, some sort of temporary fix into, into the system. And the Senate said, well, if we do that, we have to do something for workers as well. So S10 came out of the Senate with um, a freeze on what employers were paying for one year so we could figure it all out and what's called a dependent care benefit, which 13 other states have, which would be $50 a week on top of whatever unemployment claim you have, which is based on whatever your, your it's individualized. So whatever you were making in your jobs job or jobs you had prior uh, to be unemployed, that's what calculates your claim. So $50 is just flat fee for anyone who has kids under 18. Um, pretty modest because it wasn't per kid. It was just, if you have 50 kids or one kid, it's just 50 bucks. And anyone who's like anyone who pays for childcare or diapers knows that does not go very far per week. So this is pretty modest. So that comes over to Commerce. And um, my committee decided that we, they wanted to do more for employers. So they wanted to go deeper into the formula of that tax rate for employers and yank the 2020 year out, which in the formula, they have to look at 10 years. So if they're by yanking that out to fix the sort of like the, fix the, um, the employer tax rate, they're making a 10 year permanent change to the employer's tax rate versus just a one year freeze, which the governor initially asked. And they took the dependent care benefit out completely. So I dissented, it was very nerve wracking, but I dissented, I was a, in the minority. I gave a whole speech to say why this was imbalanced and not the right approach. And um, we really needed to do something for unemployed uh, Vermonters. They have a different path from this recovery, recovering from this recession than employers, but I, did not get the win the day and the bill went on and then I kept persisting. It's a lesson of persistence, so don't give up. And I went through all the caucuses that are available in the legislature, the social equity caucus, women's caucus, um, workers caucus, anybody who would listen to me. I started, you know, it's hard with Zoom. I started talking to any, you know, sort of uh, Democrat who would hear me and we were able to get back into the bill through ways and means a $25 a week um, increase for every UI claimant. So no longer attached to having kids. So 100% of folks on unemployment will be able to get a $25 increase once the federal pandemic relief dollars phase out around Labor Day. So it's a huge win for, for workers because that will last at least 13 or, or 15 years based on the calculation there. Um, so I'm very proud of that. That was, there were some dark moments where I thought we were gonna do nothing for workers and we saved the day. So with that, I need to say thank you so much for your work and looking out for the interest of labor and the true working people of Vermont. And we're going to need to bring you back to talk about, so what are you planning for next year? Yes. So thank, thank you, Emma. Thank you for joining us. We'll see you in two weeks. But in the meantime, resist. resist.